We had been on the road for three days. And to tell you the truth, it was the best three days we had had in a while. I lost my job, and with it, most of our close friends. After feeling betrayed, we also lost a baby. When I was offered work in Northern California, we were desperate to feel anything other than numb. After just one conversation with my wife, I sold my car, we took what little money we had, and started driving west. We were evacuating a life that was burning down. And after driving 2,000 miles, we were finally pulling into our new city, Redding, California. Little did we know, the city had just been issued an evacuation. This is where our story begins. While I was in the military, I was diagnosed with PTSD, stemming from childhood trauma. My dad had a short fuse. I spent the first 12 years of my life trying not to get hit. When I was in fifth grade, he beat me with a metal belt until my back and legs were discolored and bleeding. Years later, as I watched him beg for water on his deathbed, I thought about how he never showed up to my high school graduation or when I graduated from boot camp. I don't want to hate him, but I don't know how to forgive him. I was hoping to get some help here in California, but watching our new house and city burn to the ground hasn't helped. After the car fire, a guy on the sidewalk stopped me. We got to talking. He told me how the fire took his home and how much he hated living in Reading. He wanted to move anywhere else and start over. We spoke for over an hour as I was leaving, he said, you should just move back home. You're not gonna like it here. His comment didn't make me feel very hopeful. Ironically, my job was to make a film about how amazing Reading was. I met with several people to find out what makes this place so special. When I was a kid, I used to uh, watch, sometimes anyway, the, uh, the information channel, Channel 8, which was kind of running 24-7, 365, continuous loop. And they described Reading as being in the heart of the golden circle. And the idea was that you could drive an hour in any direction and be in the middle of this amazing paradise location, whether it be Hat Creek or Mount Lassen, Mount Shasta, the Trinity Alps, the Trinity River, all of these places. However, sometimes we forget about the gold that exists within our city limits. It's a big, small community. You can hardly go into town without running into somebody you know, it seems like, even though that's, you know, 90,000 or so live in Reading. I mean, we're surrounded by mountains. We get to experience all four seasons, even though it is 115 sometimes in the summertime. It's hot. You know, my family and I, we enjoy being outside and hiking and being on the lake in the summertime and camping. It's a beautiful community. A lot of our people are from Reading, even if you um, graduated and went to college elsewhere and worked for a while, a lot of people moved back here. That's what I did. When we moved here, my husband and I, I think we thought it was gonna be temporary. But, uh, you know, I feel like there's something special here. My little one can still play outside. They can walk down to the park. We're close to a lot of outdoor activities, which I personally don't love, but my family does. The favorite thing about Reading is probably the people in general. Um, I have lots of friends here, lots of relatives. 
Um, it's people that by and large care about their community. And it's one of these towns where even though, you know, we're 90 to 130,000 strong during the day, you know, there's not a place that you don't run into somebody that you know, or a family member, or somebody that knows somebody. It's a pretty close, tight-knit community. The community becomes your family. It's huge, and that's the beauty of Reading. We live and we work and we play in the same city. We think about our friends and our neighbors. We're coaching Little League with people that we work with. We've got our kids playing together. All of that really encourages people to fall in love with our community. I just saw a post the other day that said, per capita, we're the third most generous um, in donations. We kind of coined that term as like, you know, we love to be independent together which I know is kind of an oxymoron, but I love it. I love the idea that, you know, we, we cherish our independence, but we also know that we're a community. You know, the response to the car fire really demonstrates that. Maybe the guy on the sidewalk was wrong. Maybe disappointment can only make you see black and white in a world full of color. But what happens when that world is on fire? When the fire started on the 23rd, uh, we had become aware of it, and uh, we were monitoring it. And it was up in the Whiskey Town Park area, up by Car Powerhouse. The ignition of a fire out in the wildlands is not something that you really strike into your memory. You just know it's there. You you pay attention. You obviously deal with the smoke cloud that comes into the town. We've had fires out in the Whiskey Town area before. Nothing out of the ordinary. Um, the first day of the fire, we sent uh, two engines, a water tender, and a battalion chief mutual aid to Whiskey Town. The fire continued to burn. Uh, we continued to monitor it. Uh, extra resources were brought in to fight the fires. That thing made a run towards French Gulch, which has happened in the past. It wasn't till the evening of Wednesday, July 25th, that the winds came up and made a fast run clear into the border of our city. That Thursday morning, about quarter to six, I got a text from the fire chief who said the fire had moved to within a mile of the city. We thought, okay, it may come down the 299 corridor and maybe hit the city on one front. Well, that's not what happened. I mean, four different fronts hit the city of Reading. I got home and my wife was there with her friend who had left her mother at one of the homes on Eureka Way. So I was sitting looking at my paperwork for emergency response to make sure that I was studying the right material and I got a call. The fire was entering the city and so I just looked up and said, go get your mom now. And then, you know, resumed to declaring an emergency, you know, from my coffee table. Everybody came in, they called in, they came off their vacations. They came off their days off wanting to help. 10 engines trying to do the best they can to protect our community. And we knew quickly we were outgunned. Even if you could have all the engines in California there to, to fight that fire front, if we would have had enough. But our guys battled like no tomorrow. I mean, we've never seen anything like that before. That thing was such a huge fire front and on so many different areas of the city that uh, we were overwhelmed. I was surprised at that point that it entered the city. Our crews had met over on the west side and basically watched it come over Iron Mountain Road and past Station 58 and from the county into the city limits. And we had moved our resources through Sunset West, Sunset Terrace, those subdivisions, trying to keep an eye on Mary Lake, but it hadn't jumped 299 yet. And as we're deploying, we looked across the river and noticed a spot fire already. And so we basically split our crews in half. Half stayed on those subdivisions on the west side and the other half went over to the subdivisions near Land Park and Stamford Hills. Thursday morning, when we woke up and we saw that the fire was in our city. Um, I was able to get my family to a safe place about noon that day. The police chief was actively engaged in the evacuation. I mean, I think we all know that he was evacuating up in his neck of the woods and while his house was burning. Uh, I saw it jump the river around 7, 
I was in my neighborhood. In fact, I came back to watch the rest of my house burn. I got a text that came from the police chief that showed a picture of a house on fire and a simple message that said, I think I need a new paint job. Once I knew my home was burned, I was able to, like most all first responders, kind of go into work mode. The anxiety for me was gone because I was no longer worried about my home because I knew it was gone. I had about five engines under my command on the west side there with Sunset West and Sunset Terrace as that fire hit those communities and we started losing homes and realized at the same time that not all of the people had evacuated. So not only were we trying to fight fire, we're still trying to get people out of harm's way. As we brought more resources into the city to fight this fire, I was amazed at how every agency worked together. The officers worked together with uh, officers that weren't from here. We had all of the head people from each organization showing up, just saying, what can we do? Here's what we can provide you, how can we help? And we were working towards information dissemination. I called Janelle and essentially said, you're gonna be the PIO. So people were still trying to figure out where was the fire. We, we were still trying to figure out where, where are the containment lines. We had evacuated some people, and there were others who didn't know if they were evacuated or not. I was first puzzled why people were waiting so long, even after we knocked on their door and told them. I remember this one couple. I'm trying to evacuate them, and their backyard's on fire. They finally look up, and they're realizing that it's real. I think folks were kind of taken by surprise. They were thinking that because we've done such a good job of knocking down fires in the past and getting resources there, that I think we all were, were taken by surprise on uh, just the destructive nature of this and, and just how powerful it was. Our law enforcement, RPD, and the sheriff had done a really good job evacuating what they could. Um, unfortunately, some people didn't heed that warning and stayed. That was an added challenge for first responders, is getting those people out that were waiting till the last minute. Really hampers our efforts when we're trying to focus on evacuations and still fight the fire at the same time. Every question that we answered, whether it was on the phone or through our social media channels or um, even through our website, I came to those answers from the realization that people were scared, people were uneasy and uncertain about what was going on, and, and there's information that they needed to know, and I had to be able to give them that information. And I worked with the county in getting information out there and keeping that information updated consistently. People just needed to know what to do right now in this moment. When the uh, Thursday morning, when the fire started growing pretty quickly, I got into work at about 7.30 and called together my senior team and my campus safety director and physical plant director and said, I, if this keeps going, I think they're gonna call on us to be an evacuation center. And so let's start preparing now and so that if, if we got the call, we'd be ready. And it was about five o'clock or so when they called and said, look, we need, a, we need to ask if you'll do this. Um, and we immediately agreed to, uh, to serve the community in this capacity. Things were getting set up and all of a sudden it really started to blow up and everyone was fleeing and evacuating. And we opened up the gym, had room for you know several hundred people in the gym. And we had people who slept in, on the football field uh, that first night. And a lot of us were here about 24 hours straight until um, we kind of got things settled and were able to get on 12 hour shifts. But they didn't take their 12 hour shifts off. They, they probably took you know four or five hours off uh, and would come back in. For the first three, four, five nights, people were very haggard. They were tired, worn out, but everyone stayed in the fight. We have such talented people working in every department. They all came to help, from our uh, streets crew to our fire crew to REU, our electric. Everyone came to Public Works, I and mean, it was amazing to see. Everybody had a piece of the puzzle to fix this uh, devastation, and they all rose to the occasion. Days after the fire started, footage surfaced, revealing the face of the monster they had fought. The car fire has just exploded again. Now, everything now. is moving so quickly. This, there is this trailer behind me. May possibly be the origin of this fire. The 
tornado that we saw and experienced was not like anything else we've ever experienced. We have a lot of wildland fires here, but never have they formed into a tornado, a fire tornado that was mile high, half mile wide, because this storm was so big, this firestorm, that everyone could see the fire as soon as they looked out, and it looked super close to where they were because it was that massive. And it frightened people uh, for good reason. Lots of factors generated that thing and, and produced that historic event. We'd never seen anything like that before. Nothing in the North State has ever been recorded before. You know, that thing had winds, they say it was like an F3 tornado, 135 to 165 mile an hour winds. From my standpoint, being up in that neighborhood, it was almost immediate. I saw three or four distinct fires and they all merged as it jumped that river and uh, started a uh, swirling and uh, it just became massive. They all became one and uh, just marched through those subdivisions like they weren't even there. What we thought on the ground level was just a huge fire front and fire blowing through and we've seen that before. Well, not until a couple days later after seeing uh, video from the helicopter that it was actually a fire tornado and we were right underneath it. People are running, people are scared. Everything was black, it was raining embers, the wind was blowing, our fire hoses were really ineffective when you have five to 10, 20 homes burning at the same time. You know, we were trying our best to make a difference and uh, man, it was, a, it was a heck of a fight. You don't know how to fight something like that and again, our best course of action was to stay out of its way because there was nothing we can do at that point to stop it. Really lucky um, that uh, we didn't lose more of our guys and uh, more firefighters and more citizens because that thing was enormous. You know, unfortunately, our fire inspector, Jeremy Stoke, got caught in it. I was his captain, he was my engineer, my driver, and uh, we had a great time here. Jeremy was a guy that would do anything for you. He called, wanted to check on the fire and see how it was doing. I said, hey, it's, it's getting really big and uh, it's coming towards the city and, and you know, at some point it's gonna hit the city limits. I said, you know, where are you? And he said, well, I'm on vacation in Oregon. I said, well, you're the lucky one. Uh, stay there, and enjoy your time off and um, we're good. All our crews are working, we'll see you when you get back. Next day he showed up and that's the kind of guy Jeremy was. He knew it was big, he knew it was gonna hit the city and his community, and uh, he wanted to be part of it. After the fire had impacted our city, my dispatch uh, contacted me and said, hey, we, we can't reach Inspector Stoke. I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, we can't reach him by phone or by radio. Well, in my mind, he's just out working, and like we all are, and I was away from my vehicle, my guys are away from the engines, you know, fighting fire and helping people get out. Got a hold of my dispatcher who said uh, at some point, some CAL FIRE um, investigators and RPD and the sheriff were now out looking. And they had, um, you know, pinged his cell phone. And at that point, I'm thinking, well, maybe he is really missing. Went to that area on the west side where they had pinged his cell phone just to kind of start my search. So I couldn't get through a gate, so I actually took off on foot, running up through these hills and looking for his truck and Jeremy. And then our um, unit chief from CAL FIRE called and uh, he was at my vehicle and asked where I was. And I said, uh, you know, I'm looking for Jeremy. And he said, so am I, I'll pick you up. So when I came down and got in the car with our uh, unit chief and the sheriff was sitting in there, kind of hit home that he's really missing. Hearing all these stories, I did what any rational person would do. I curled into a ball. I don't know. Maybe the guy on the sidewalk was right. But should I have just gone back home? 
My PTSD is working overtime. There has to be a reason I moved here at that specific moment, though. I guess I did get a pretty rad job. The people I work with are pretty amazing. Well, most of them. Just kidding. We lost our house, but a couple we didn't even know let us live with them for like a month. I guess I've just been so focused on what went wrong, I didn't recognize all the good things happening. Man, I gotta stop acting like a baby. We saved a lot of lives. We moved a lot of people out of harm's way. A lot of homes are still standing today because of our efforts and obviously the efforts of everybody assigned to the car fire. So, I mean, we made a, we did make a positive um, difference, but it's sometimes it's, it's, that's bittersweet. It's hard to look at that aspect when, when our community lost so much. Everybody worked together. There were even volunteers from this city that I'm so thankful for that rose up and helped our business owners, helped our citizens, people they didn't even know they would feed and clothe. And so I'm not only proud of our first responders, but the citizens in this community and the volunteers. It's just to me, looking back on it, it's just amazing. People did what they could to get us through this, from kids on the corner with thank you signs, to feeding us, to keep us going. And that, to me, is what I will remember forever, is how this community came together. I'm not sure there's anybody out there that in some shape or form wasn't affected or knew somebody somehow that was affected by the car fire. Even if you only had to evacuate your home for a couple days, it's still traumatic. For that brief period of time, there was no independence. It was just a giant community. And I heard that over and over again from people who were traveling here from uh, other places to help out. And they talked constantly about how amazed they were that our community was so tight knit and they were amazed at the generosity and the signs that went up thanking them and you know the love that was being expressed. Uh, and one thing that I really appreciated is they said they've never seen a city and its workers so gelled and so, uh, you know, able to work beyond any barriers or boundaries. I mean, this has always been a close-knit community. It always has. And, you know, the people that live here are proud to live here. And, you know, we're not gonna let a 200,000 acre fire knock us down. People just started showing up at the fire stations and dropping off bottled water and Gatorade and soda and food and pies, cake, cookies, full meals. I mean, our we had so much food but this community really stepped up to support us and and it wasn't just food and and um, you know a lot of people <clears throat> a lot of people just knocked on the door just because they wanted to give us a hug and uh, meant a lot meant a lot to me and and my guys it really did The fire revealed so much. At first, it was another sad story to add to my list of complaints, but I noticed the city refused to be victims of circumstance. I believe the most powerful thing a human being can do is make a decision. Heroes make selfless decisions. Reading is filled with heroes. Just when I was convinced that this community had given everything they had, they showed the world what love looked like. And we've been sharing stories of the community joining together to support firefighters and law enforcement and those who lost their homes. But today we are seeing an entirely new form of selfless compassion. They're now reaching out to tell the owners of the trailer with the flat tire, which is believed to have caused the car fire, that they forgive them. So she posted the request on social media. 
And two days later, they keep coming in. We are grieving on this side, you know, having lost all things. And to know that the couple who was responsible for the accident, how would they grieve now? How would they feel? When I met a friend who knew the couple, I asked, do you think I can give you a letter and you would take it to them? I would just write a card and would you deliver it to them? And he was happy to take it. So I felt if I am doing this, my friends would also want to do this, you know? And I, I, I posted online and on Facebook. My friend asked if she could share it with her friends who were also willing to write a letter. Then I said, yeah, sure, it doesn't hurt to get more letters. Woke up in the morning with so many notifications that it has been shared so many times and so many people have responded. And I was going through the comments and I sat there crying. My husband looked at me and what happened? Look at this, people shared their own raw stories of how they encountered guilt and shame and how things have turned around, what they did. And it was such real raw beauty. We received about 650 cards and letters just from Reading community within 24 hours. And that became national news. That created so much more response from people in our nation, people from different states, Boston, New York, neighboring states, Washington, Oregon, so many other counties in California. All of them started sending letters. Even people who lost everything, like their homes burned down, they wrote letters saying, we don't hold this against you. You know, we love you. It's just an accident. Don't live in shame. Don't live in guilt. I never expected that the community would respond like this. It just made me cry. You know, people go through a lot of things. Having known now what they've been through on the other side of the coin, it is hard for anyone to go through such deep pain. You know, whether you do things right or wrong, there's always a second chance to rebuild life. As much as the lake and the river, the mountains and all of that beauty that enters into the quality of life in our community, I think that our greatest asset really is the people of Reading. It's gonna take a long time for us to get through this, but we are with the community. Not only in normal times do we have each other's backs, but uh, in the very difficult times we can, we can pull together and accomplish great things. Our citizens really step up in a time of need and support each other. And uh, you know, we'll come back from this. Car Fire, we really will, we'll be stronger than ever. I think Car Fire has forced us all to look into each other's eyes and discover the human kindness in each one of us. Knowing that we can come together and uh, work as well as we did, we don't have to lack hope for, for the recovery and for this community. We're resilient and uh, together it's gonna recover and, and be stronger than ever. We live in a great place. And our city, our city is kind of amazing. This fire came over the hills and ravaged the city, creating a mess in thousands of lives. The memory of it still knocks the wind out of people. It was the worst thing some people had ever experienced. But despite the tragedy, I saw a community show the world what it means to be human standing stronger than any wildfire could ever be. And all of a sudden, just like that, the devastation in my own life didn't seem so devastating. If they can forgive and let go, so can I. So whenever someone asks me, what kind of people live in Reading? I'll tell them, the kind that won't stand by. The kind that believe thank yous aren't enough.
the kind that pull out their wallet and feed you. The type that forgive and honor you. The kind that sacrifice themselves to save one another. The kind that love you. I'm overwhelmed, and for the first time in a long time, I feel joy again. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you.